dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Stirring words spoken by Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg may be the most famous presidential speech in American history. Um, be hard pressed to find one that's more famous. One of the most famous speeches in the history of the world. And it's probably something where you know the beginning, four score and seven years ago. And you might know the last few words, the, the of the people, by the people, for the people, part of government. Um, but a lot of what he said in between has just kind of overlooked. You know, people look at it and they know it's a famous speech, but they haven't really looked at what he said there. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at what did he say, why did he say it, and how does it change the war. That's our goal for the day. What we need to start off with is where we were yesterday and start with Gettysburg. Gettysburg was the deadliest battle of the entire Civil War. So it's the deadliest battle of the deadliest war in American history. It was devastating to Confederate hopes. As you can see there, it says after this, the South really has no chance of defeating the North. Now, it doesn't mean the war is over. Remember, the South doesn't have to defeat the North. All they have to do is not lose. If they can string this out, maybe the northern people, the northern government might decide that they've had enough of this. But that was the last chance that the Confederates had really to try and seize victory, Lee go up north, conquer one of the major northern cities, and bring the war to a close right now. Gettysburg was a disastrous loss for Lee. He is able to slink away and save his army, which incenses Lincoln again, just like it, it did after McClellan let him get away after Antietam. Uh, the new general, who was more successful than, than McClellan was at Antietam with fewer advantages, um, sent a proud message about how they had deriv driven the invaders from our soil, and Lincoln about blew a gasket. He was like, when are the generals going to realize that it's all our soil? That's what the whole war is about, that you can't drive the enemy from our soil when the, that enemy and their soil belongs to us too. So, you know, he just he flipped out after he heard that. Now, he's not going to fire Meade. What he's eventually going to do is he's going to hire somebody to be one step higher on the food chain. And if you look at that slide, you can see the answer is there. Um, Gettysburg happens on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. July 4th, 1863, the news just gets worse for the Confederates. It's on July 4th that the town of Vicksburg, Mississippi, surrenders to the Union Army under Ulysses S. Grant. Now, the significance of that, Vicksburg is not a very big town, just like Gettysburg is not a very big town. But what happens there is very, very important. Vicksburg was a... A city that was high over the Mississippi River, and the Confederates, as long as they controlled Vicksburg, Union vessels, boats, could not go up and down the Mississippi River, which closed that major transportation artery off to the Midwest of the United States. The farmers of the Midwest couldn't get their crops out. They couldn't, you know, it was much more difficult to get that food stuff to the east and to the army of the east so opening up the mississippi river was a huge accomplishment for the union army and grant was able to accomplish that with the surrender of vicksburg on july 4th 1863 the other thing it did was it split the confederacy in two the, the mississippi river is such a massive barrier to transportation that once that last town that the confederates held on the mississippi river was given up that meant that the Confederates were not going to be able to transfer stuff from east and west. You had Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas, and a lot of food in Texas that were suddenly shut off to the Confederates. It might as well have been on the other side of the world. might as well have been on the moon. Once they lost control of Vicksburg, that stuff was not going to be available to them. So the first four days of July were nothing but bad news for the Confederacy. Okay, so the question then becomes, but the question I'm asking is, why have a Gettysburg Address? There, it is the deadliest battle in America's deadliest war. 
But Antietam was the deadliest day in American history, and that doesn't lead to an address, a speech like that. So what what actually happens? What are the, the steps that lead to the delivery of the Gettysburg Address? Why, why is that speech given? Um, if you look at this, you look at the math of the situation, what you don't often read about in history textbooks is the aftermath of battle. Gettysburg is a town of a little more than 2,000 people, which actually made it a pretty sizable town in those days. Um, but now there are 7,000 plus dead bodies laying around the town of Gettysburg, and the armies have moved on. You know, they, they, have, uh, they have more fighting to do. Lee's army retreats back to Virginia, and Meade lets him go, which I had already talked about. That just drives Abraham Lincoln insane that he has to deal with a general that lets Lee get away. Um, Coach Benish and I were talking about this, and his added, you know his understanding and what he's read is that me didn't realize how big of a battle he had won and how successful he was. You know, all he knew is that Lee almost broke through his line several times, and that was you know all he knew. So he thought maybe it was closer than what it actually was. So he's happy to let Lee get away. All right, so. The armies have left Gettysburg, and the issue is, stop and think about this for a second, it's, it's July. It's July, and there are 7,000 soldiers that are now lying dead in town, in the fields, in the peach orchard, in the boulders, all over, in and around Gettysburg in July. And so... What happens is to try and prevent the whole town from just stinking with decay and what soldiers might have done before they moved on is try and bury their friends wherever they fell. So they, there are guys getting, there are soldiers getting buried all over in and around the town of Gettysburg, in the fields around Gettysburg. It's just, it's the best you can do under a terrible situation. So that is not the way we traditionally treat our honored war dead in the United States. We try and do better than that. And so the decision is made to actually create a national cemetery there at Gettysburg. Now this is a process that's going to continue for 10 years. They're going to try and continue to find other people that are missing. This predates anything like dog tags or any kind of identification of bodies. So they're doing the best they can here, and it takes a long time. The decision is made to actually go out and try and find as many bodies as they can, exhume them, and then bury them again in this new national cemetery. And just as a side note, the winning bid for the person or the you know, company that's going to do this was a dollar a body. They were paid a dollar a body to go out and try and find bodies, try and find something on the body that would help identify the person or maybe hopefully you know, their comrades uh, scratched out some kind of crude headstone or headboard you know, before they buried them and to give you some sort of idea who this person is or maybe find some piece of mail on, on the, uh, the corpse. So the process takes months. Actually, like I said, it takes years. It takes ten, up to 10 years where they're still working on this. So long story short is after about five months, they're ready to dedicate the cemetery. Um, November 19th, 1863, they're going to have a dedication ceremony. And as you're about ready to hear, um, the featured speaker was a guy by the name of Edmund Everett, who was a famous order. You know, this is before movies. This is before professional sports, a lot of times you would go and just listen to somebody speak that was, you know, good at it. And so that's who they bring in to be the um, featured person there for this ceremony that they're going to have for the dedication of the cemetery. And then somebody decides at the last minute, you know what, maybe we should invite the president. So the pres Abraham Lincoln is not the featured speaker that day. He's, he's there almost as an afterthought. So Lincoln goes to Gettysburg to give the Gettysburg Address on November 19th, 1863 to dedicate the new cemetery there. 
And so he is going to go there. He's asked to give a few appropriate remarks. Now, at this point, what I want you to do is I want you to press pause on me and in your notes, watch the video that is there for the Gettysburg Address. Okay, pause this tape and go and watch that one. After that one's over, come back to me. I always find that amazing that Lincoln thought his speech was a failure. You know, his speech won't scowl. That uh, they uh, he didn't know. And actually, I guess you know, one of the things to consider is that the crowd is probably a little stunned that he's finished speaking already. That might explain a little bit of the lack of applause, you know, because um, regardless of which president you're talking about recently. We know today that presidents like to hear themselves speak, so the idea that he would only speak for about two minutes is almost unheard of, even for that time. And Lincoln was famous for giving some short speeches. You know, one time he gave a speech that was just one sentence. So that might explain a little bit why the crowd was kind of like, okay, what just happened here? Um, there's... They, they mentioned in that video that there's only one known photograph of Lincoln speaking there. That's not true. That's actually, there's a holy grail kind of search for photos of Lincoln at Gettysburg. And a couple have been found since that video was made 30 years ago. And if somebody finds one somewhere stuffed in their attic, they are worth millions of dollars. So just as a side note there. All right, so let's, let's look at what he actually said. Um, there's the text of his speech. Um, with the, the, that first line is really, really famous. Four scored seven years ago. I don't know if anybody's ever broke that down for you. The score is 20, so four times 20 is 80. Four, so four score and seven is 87. It's 1863. We do the math. 1863 minus 87 is 1776. So he is talking about 1776. He is talking about the Declaration of Independence. So he starts by referring to the Declaration of Independence and the text of that, which is the part that he's most concerned with, <clears throat> the, the part that the Declaration that, he's, that he then talks about, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. So right there, all men are created equal, some of the phrasing of the Declaration of Independence. So that is what he starts by referencing. Um, one of the things that we sometimes forget about the deck, uh, excuse me, the Gettysburg Address is that it's also a political speech. Lincoln wasn't sure that he was going to get reelected in 1864. They didn't know in November of 1863 that they were going to win. Um, well, sometimes we forget that when we're studying history. We have this hindsight that, you know, the Union wins. So you kind of start thinking, well, they knew that they were going to win. They didn't. Lincoln has a big job to deal with here. Um, he is trying to convince... Sorry. Okay, so I'm back. I had Ms. Bach gave me a call about something, so... All right, so the deal is he is giving a political speech here. He has to convince the people of the North that it's still worth fighting for. Um, they have been fighting and dying for more than two years now. Remember, they, the, the, the people of both sides thought that this thing would be over in a couple of months. It hasn't been. Two years plus. More people have been killed than all other American wars combined at that point. Um, Gettysburg as a battle almost does that. And it doesn't look like they're that much closer to victory. So part of this speech is a political speech to try and sell people on the idea of the war. He's got to try and motivate the people of the North to finish this thing up because that is one way that the Confederates can win is if they just don't lose if they refuse to lose and the union army and the people of the north decide you know what this just is not worth it the, and decide to quit then the confederates win so a big part of this speech 
is him trying to sell the American people on the idea that, hey, we need to keep going. He is speaking as a president who is trying to get reelected and who is trying to sell his political program. Don't forget that for a second. That's part of this. Um, but then a bigger part, the most important part for us is the final idea that he's trying to sell the American people on. And that is that maybe there's an even higher purpose for this conflict. That he started in 1861 when they thought it would be over in a heartbeat with just saying, hey, we're just doing this, put the country back together. We put the country back together, this whole thing's over. But with the Emancipation Proclamation and the promise of it, he's now saying, look, it's not just that we're going to put the country back together, but we're going to put it back together differently than what it was when, when we all went our separate ways there and war broke out. But with this Gettysburg Address, he's adding even a third layer. Now what he's saying is, we are going to fight for equality. We are going to redefine what those words in the Declaration of Independence mean, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. So in this speech, he is now talking about a new birth of freedom and actually referring to that Declaration of Independence and meaning it. Now, there's something else to consider here. You know, again, we look back at Abraham Lincoln, and almost universally he is ranked as either the best or the second best president in American history. So he has you know, this almost untouchable reputation. But he was just a guy that was trying to sell the American people on the idea that we need to actually do better than what we've done. And not everybody is going to be supportive of that. But when the war is over, this is now part of the conversation. Is victory going to mean that we are going to try and work towards equality? That's what Lincoln wants to fight for. Doesn't mean that everybody else is going to be signing up for that, especially the former southern states. They're going to do everything they can to make sure that that doesn't happen. But within the people of the North, he is changing the game, and a lot of people aren't sure what to think of that. Now, obviously, more are on board with this. You know, he's not booed off the stage, and he's not rejected out of hand after that. He has given this war a higher purpose. But we do also need to remember as we move forward that that's going to be the subject of debate. And then complicating things, as we will find out, you should recall, is that Lincoln's not there long after the war to see if this actually happens. Okay. So at this point, Go ahead and click on the link there to answer the questions about what we've covered here and to break down the Gettysburg Address, look at the text and see where does he actually say these things. All right, so click on that link and go ahead and answer those questions.